about four or five years ago, ELAC released what I consider to be a bombshell into the hi-fi community, namely the debut series, particularly the largest bookshelf speaker within that series. At the time, there was nothing else like it, nothing else that offered the same kind of performance for the same amount of money. I'm talking about something that would deliver the traits that audiophiles could appreciate while at the same time embodying the virtues that the real world music lover values, namely something that's very easy to listen to with big, strong bass from an otherwise ordinary sized loudspeaker. Since then, it's forced every other loudspeaker manufacturer in the business to step up their game. And the net result of that is now we're living in a time to where there are tons of high value propositions out there. But really and truly, I think we have Elac and Andrew Jones and his team to thank for that. Now, of course, his work really started with Kef and then Pioneer, but it's his work with Elac that really started this trend towards what we're enjoying today. Now, as some of you know, since then, there's been a second iteration of the debut series. And the story behind that is while a lot of people like the original debut series, it had a lot of coloration to the sound, particularly the bookshelf speakers. They're rolled off on top, bumped up in the bass, so what they did with the second generation is that they cleaned up the sound and gave it more of a balanced presentation. Now that leads me to the debut references. So the debut references do not replace the 2.0 series at all. Instead, what happened is Elac went to Andrew Jones and basically said, okay, what we want is the best expression of this sound, but we still wanna keep it affordable. So we're gonna increase your budget by so many dollars. What can you do with that? Well, this is what he came up with. Now, to be clear, it's not replacing the Unify line. Odds are there's gonna be plans with that line since it's been around for so long. This is just meant to be the ultimate expression of that overall debut sound. So let's take a closer look at the speaker. Okay, so while I can't reveal the budget that Andrew was given to build these speakers, what I can do is talk about his intentions, which essentially was to take the 6.2 bookshelf speaker and then improve it in every single way. And what we ended up with is what you see right here, a two and a half way front ported loudspeaker. Up top, we are gonna have a one inch soft dome that comes from the 6.2, only now it's in a much better waveguide. We have a better grill in front of it. We also have our six and a half inch aramid fiber cone, only this actually now uses a cast surround. We also have improvements to the spider. Beneath that, instead of having a regular port, we now have a slotted port, which is gonna be lower noise, is gonna help to improve dynamic and bass performance. And inside, we're gonna have a better crossover. And the biggest difference is gonna be the cabinets. So the original debuts have very thin cabinets. This speaker is very solid, something you can feel. So it has better bracing, the materials are thicker, and they're just more inert. Also, that left a, just a little bit more room for aesthetics. So now we have this nice veneer, or is it a wrap? Anyways, this sample came with walnut on the back. We are gonna have our five-way binding post. The price is gonna be $600 a pair, and that's gonna be it for the debut references. So now it's time to talk about how they sound. Okay, so to keep this evaluation nice and organized, first I'm going to address those of you who already have experience with the Elac debut line, and then after that I'm going to address everybody else. So, to those of you who either own and or have owned any of the Elac debut speakers in the past, particularly the bookshelf speakers, this is what you can expect from the debut reference bookshelf speakers. In short, what you're going to get is a very familiar sound. In fact, it has the same overall character and presentation. That excellent balance between the treble, the mid-range, and the bass, that slightly warm character to it, easy to listen to treble, something that's unfussy to work with, and very forgiving of poor recordings. All of that is still going to be there, except now the performance has been bumped up in pretty much every single way. The top end is gonna be similar, only now it's more extended, more detailed, and more refined sounding. The mid-range and the bass are gonna be cleaner. The dynamic output's gonna be better. The power handling characteristics are gonna be better. And the biggest difference I think most people are gonna notice is that the cabinet resonance that's very audible within a regular debut series is no longer nearly as audible with the debut references. Now the big question is, is it worth the price? Is it worth the upgrade? Well, if you already have debut speakers and you really love them and you just wish that you just had a little bit more of everything, then yeah, absolutely. But if you have the debut speakers right now and you want a big jump in performance, then I would recommend holding on to your money and saving up until you can afford something that's a tier or two above what the debut references have to offer. Anyways, that's going to be my take on that situation. So now let me address everybody else who's never heard a pair of debuts before. Okay, so for everybody else, this is what you can expect from the debut references. 
So let's start off by going over what they aren't. So what you're not gonna get out of these speakers is that classic V-curve presentation with the boosted treble and boosted bass. These aren't meant to impress you right out the gate. And what they're also not gonna do is project sound in a forward way to where it sounds like the performance is taking place only a few feet from your listening position. Again, that's not what these speakers are all about. Instead, what they're all about is delivering a very balanced jack of all trades performance to where they're good in pretty much every single category that you can think of, but they're not overdone in any way. And the whole goal is to end up with a product that's easy to work with. It's not gonna be particular about placement, about the kind of gear that you use, or the kind of music that you listen to. In fact, Eli knows that most of the people who use these speakers are gonna be connecting them to AVRs or inexpensive integrated amps, and they're gonna be listening to music that was never really recorded all too well. And you hear that in the voicing of the product, which leads me to its character. So when you listen to this speaker, you're gonna notice that yes, it does have a bit of a character to it. There's gonna be warmth to the sound, particularly within the mid-range and the bass. And you're also gonna notice that the top end is gonna be very easy to listen to, but it is gonna be tilted upwards just a little bit. And that leads me to the individual elements of the presentation, starting with the treble. So the treble is interesting because compared to a lot of speakers in this range, it's actually fairly smooth and easy going. But if you're used to listening to a lot of speakers in this range, you're gonna notice that it's tilted up just a little bit. And I think they have very intelligent voicing going on here because people, when they spend their money on something like this, they wanna hear information, they wanna hear detail. And you definitely get that out of the debut references, but it's not beating you over the head with information. And I think that's the right balance because again, most people who buy speakers like this are gonna be listening to what I call real world music and recordings usually suck. So this speaker is gonna enable you to enjoy good detail without making it fatiguing and irritating to listen to over the long haul. Now let's move on to the mid-range. So the mid-range is arguably gonna be the star to show. The one thing that I love about the mid-range is that it doesn't have that classic dip between the tweeter and the woofer. The handoff is very well done, leaving you with this full sounding presentation. Now there is gonna be some warmth to the sound, but I think that's a good thing. It helps to add some dimension to the sound, and also it helps to add some body to the presentation of a bookshelf speaker. Vocals sound really good. Instrument timber sounds really good for something at this price point. And again, I don't think there's gonna to be too many people who can complain about the mid-range. It's actually one of the better mid-range performances that you're gonna hear at this price. Moving on to the bass, the bass is gonna have a warm, strong character to it. It's not gonna be the quickest bass in the world, nor is it gonna be overly fat sounding. It kind of rides that balance, which again, for something at this price point, I think is a very good thing. People like it when you have strong bass output from a relatively compact speaker. Now let's talk about dynamic output. Dynamic output is going to be good. Now, is it gonna be the most dynamic speaker that you're gonna find at this price? Well, no, but it's gonna handle those peaks and passages very well. Pan power handling, excuse me, is gonna be very good out of this speaker. So if you like to listen at louder volumes, I feel like the debut references can handle louder volumes a lot better than the 6.2s beneath them. Now, let's talk about imaging. So on and off axis performance is going to be very good. As you get up and you move around a room, the sound of the speakers don't change very much. The tonal balance remains intact. Now, I do find that they benefit from a little bit of toe-in, but beyond that, the imaging is gonna be as good as you would expect from any competently designed two-way monitor. Otherwise, guys, I think that's about it. So why don't we talk about the kind of gear that it works well with and what kind of setup tips that you can do in order to get the best sound out of these. Actually, there's one more thing I forgot to comment on, and that's how they perform at low volumes. So historically speaking, the debut line has never been that good at very quiet volumes. They're the kind of speaker to where you need to apply some volume in order to enjoy the best presentation, but I feel like the debut references are a lot better in that regard. Maybe it's courtesy of the quieter cabinet, the overall cleaner presentation, but I feel like you don't really have to crank the music in order to enjoy a nice, full, and balanced presentation out of them. So if you like to listen at low volumes, they're gonna be a fairly good option for you. Now, let's talk about those tips. Okay, so now it's time to talk about what you can do to really get great performance out of the debut references. So let's start off by going over positioning. 
Number one, these speakers sound best when you can give them room to breathe. I'm talking about pulling them out a good two to three feet away from any wall boundary. What this is gonna do is this is gonna give you clean bass output, and it's also gonna give you really good balance between the treble, the mid-range, and the bass. Now, don't get me wrong. If you have to put them against the wall, that's fine. Just know that you're gonna get additional bass output, which may be a good or a bad thing for you, depending on your room and, of course, to your taste. Next, as with any good bookshelf speaker, they benefit from really good stands. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to spend a whole lot of money. In fact, you can go to monoprice.com, get one of their stands, fill them with dry sand, and you're gonna have a really good affordable foundation for them. And now let's talk about positioning. So these speakers were meant to sound best when facing directly out into the room with no toe in. This is what's gonna give you the best on and off axis performance with really good balance between the treble, the mid range, and the bass. But this is something that you can easily experiment with for yourself to figure out what you like best. For example, I like the sound with just a little bit of tone because it preserves the tonal balance as well as giving me a locked in center image between both speakers. And of course, if you like more of a lively presentation, you can point them more towards you and you're gonna get more of a boost within the top end. Now, let's talk about equipment matching. So these speakers do like their power and I think for most people who are likely gonna be running solid state amplifiers, a good 50 to 100 watts is where you're gonna wanna be. Now, don't get me wrong. You can get away with, say, a 30 watt per channel amplifier, be it tube or solid state, if you're in a small room and you listen at fairly modest volumes. Now, let's talk about the kind of tone that you should be going for. As I mentioned earlier, you really almost have to try to get bad sound out of these speakers. So if you wanna buy, like, say, a $70 Class D amplifier off Amazon, you're going to get really good sound. Even though most of those amplifiers sound relatively cool, it can make for a really good, cheap, and cheerful match. But in order to really maximize the performance out of these speakers without going crazy with your money, I would say the Marantz 5005 is gonna be a good match if you want more of an exciting sound. So let's say you like the idea of a balanced speaker, but you want just a little bit more character to it, the Marantz 5005 with the boosted bass and boosted treble is going to give that to you. Or if you just wanna double down onto Elac strengths, the IOTA VX SA3 integrated amplifier will do a great job of that. But overall, the benefit with having a fairly balanced speaker is that you can voice it almost according to your taste. So just buy the electronics that are gonna steer it in the direction that you want it to go in. The last thing that I wanna mention is that even though these speakers will give you better performance as you upgrade your electronics, I feel like there's no logical point on spending more than $1,000 per component if you're running these speakers. At that point, you're just gonna benefit from getting better speakers uh, if you wanna go the higher end route. But anyways, guys, that's gonna be my take on this situation. Now let's go over some of the caveats. So I'm gonna level with you guys. There's not a whole lot to complain about with these speakers. I mean, aesthetically, some people are gonna like them, some people aren't. Sonically, again, it's the same story. Some people are really gonna love these speakers. They're gonna appreciate the balance and those slight warm character to the sound. They're gonna appreciate how they can listen to music for a long time without fatigue. And others are gonna to listen to this and absolutely not like it at all. They want something that's more exciting, something that just has a different type of a presentation, which is why there's so many options out there. But otherwise, guys, I can't think of anything to really criticize here when I look at what the speaker was designed to do and how it actually goes about doing its job. So what I'm gonna do now is to wrap up this review with my final thoughts. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this on a completely subjective note. On one hand, I am completely unsurprised by the performance of the debut reference because number one, it has the kind of sound that I expected, meaning that it takes the overall character of the debut series and just improves upon it in pretty much every single way. I expected that. And I also expected this speaker to perform very well against others in this hotly contested market. I mean, this is Andrew Jones we're talking about. I mean, this is the guy who kind of sparked this trend for high value bookshelf loudspeakers. But the surprising thing is how unsurprised I am because just a couple of years ago, something like the debut reference would have been a shock to the hi-fi landscape it would have been the next big thing, right? It's something that every publication would be raving about. I would likely be raving about it. But here we are in just a couple of years, we've arrived to this point in hi-fi to where there's so many really good options between five to $600 that these speakers just become yet another really good entry to consider. 
and they're going to be for somebody who wants that jack of all trades performance, that slightly warm sound, and somebody who acknowledges that, hey, look, I don't listen to the best recorded material or even really good material most of the time. I mean, a lot of the music that I listen to is kind of recorded like crud, but I want something that will reward me on the occasion when I do listen to a good recording while at the same time being friendly and forgiving enough to where I can listen to my music and actually connect to it and enjoy it. That's who this speaker is going to be for. And the great news is that Elac is such a successful company that it's very easy to either audition these speakers first or to buy it from a retailer that offers a generous trial period. So this is something that's easy for you to try out for yourself. But otherwise, guys, that's going to be my take on the debut reference. A really good jack-of-all-trades speaker It's not going to be for everybody, right? If you want that more lively and colorful sound, there's going to be other options out there for you. But for that listener that wants that warm, friendly jack-of-all-trades solution, it's definitely worth considering. Anyways, guys, I know at the end of my reviews, I always have comparisons, and I know what speakers you want me to compare these to, but here's the deal. I'm going to save that for a completely separate video because that's going to be a whole subject all to its own. So this is actually going to be the true end of this review. As always, thanks for watching, and until next time, peace.